Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this installment of Boyce Thompson Institute's new Breaking Ground discussion series. Uh, my name is AJ Bushy. I'm in the communications department here at BTI. And um, for this month's program, we welcome Dr. Magdalena Julkowska, a plant stress physiologist here at BTI, whose main research focus is how environmental stress affects plant development and architecture. And today we'll be talking about Magda's work using a method called high throughput phenotyping, which involves some pretty cool gadgets in right on time. Here she is. Hi, Magda. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> before we get started, um, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, during the session, all participants will be muted and you can ask us questions in the chat or there's a little Q&A box down below. You can type your questions in there um, and then we'll, we'll answer them at the end. And the way we scheduled is it's like about a half hour, the whole thing's about an hour, half hour discussion between uh, me and Magda, and then about a half hour for Q&A at the end. Um, so you can ask live questions of Dr. Jewel Kowska. And uh, you may notice I've enabled a, uh, a live transcript function. Um, so you could be seeing, uh, you should be seeing uh, like closed caption transcripts um, down at the bottom of your screen. If you want to turn that off, you can go down there and there's a live transcript button with a little CC and you can go in there and say hide transcript. Um, so if you don't wanna see those, you can do that. <clears throat> and uh, so thank you all again for joining us today. It looks like we have a, we have a good, a good um, number of folks joining us from all over the world. That's really cool. So Magda, let's kick it off. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your research, what you're doing these days? Yes. Um, so obviously from my name, from my last name, you can tell I'm Polish. So I was born in Poland. Uh, my parents moved to the Netherlands uh, when I was in high school, which is not the best time to move. Uh, but I was always fascinated. I, will, I like to be outdoors. I was always fascinated by how things are working and problem solving. So I started doing studying biology at the University of Amsterdam. And I finished my master and PhD there. And um, in my uh, during my PhD, I was supervised by Krista Testering. Um, and um, that's um, that kind of led me to 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 um, focusing on how plant is not just as just a bag of cells, but that like how how plant is organized in terms of its ar architecture. Um, and then later on, um, I moved, I was invited to, uh, to the lab of Professor Mark Tester, um, who started his lab in Saudi Arabia, which wasn't the place that I was ever thinking of living, but I was very glad to go there and, and, and experience this, this adventure and amazing country. And I learned a lot about the culture of the place. Uh, I met a lot of people from there people from around the world and and we kind of kept on working but on thinking about like how plants how we can further dissect how the plant is reacting to the environment by looking not only at it as like this green blob that is just becoming bigger but dividing it into individual organs and following the growth of those organs um, and also there I learned a little bit more about high throughput phenotyping and you can see in here all of all of the amazing people that I worked with in Kaust, um, including some of the collaborators from from abroad and some of the students that I know some of them might be watching as well. Um, and last summer, so I was actually supposed to be joining BTI uh, in the spring. That was of course delayed because of the global pandemic. Um, but last summer I joined the BTI and together with Andrew Nelson, we have um, a kind of a cluster lab where we're working together. We still have a lab meetings. We had one this morning together and we have amazing group of people working, working with us. So they are all, uh, their pictures are, are all at the, close to the BTI logo. And um, yeah, I, I thought I had, I I'm going to have a lot more challenges starting my own group because it's always like, oh, am I a grown up now? Uh, <laughs> uh, so that was, uh, they, they, the people made it a very easy and pleasant start and, uh, and, and they contribute to help me develop the ideas and, and make all of the exciting science happen. Well, that's great to hear. Yeah. 
Uh, and you mentioned early on, you talked about uh, plant architecture. Mm -hmm. I think you said root architecture. Could you yes. talk more about that? Like what, what fascinates you about architecture? So roots are the hidden half of the plant. So if something is hidden, I'm going to go and, and check it out. Not only because I'm Polish, but also just because I'm curious. So we Polish people, like if something is hidden, I'm going to go and scratch where that is. Um, anyway, so uh, the roots, especially in terms of uh, abiotic stress or salinity, and that's that's what I what I started working with. Root is the very first organ that is um, that is sensing that something is changing in the soil, and and some things could be changing because you've got less precipitation going on, which is um, limiting the fresh water hold, the water holding capacity of the soil. And that's by itself is also increasing the concentrations of the ions within the soil. Um, the, or, salt, the salt ions, sodium ions and salt. Yes. So it's mainly, so salinity stress, it can be caused by the different ion uh, types, cations, mm -hmm. uh, but it's mainly globally, it's most of, most of it is sodic, sodic soils. So you can see, and, and the salt stress is very, very different depending on the region. Because if you, if you talk about increasing salinity, for example, in the Nile Delta, it's caused because you've got the dams that are right now built on the Nile and you don't have, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and you don't have the, the floods that are coming in and flooding all of those iron deposited during the drier seasons. Um, but if you if we're talking about um, salt stress, for example, in Australia, there are salt pans that are deeper in the ground. And when they when people started to um, deforest those regions, um, and then the trees were keeping the groundwater very very low, all of a sudden the groundwater was not controlled by the tree. So then it kind of dissolved through the salt pans, and the salt started to accumulate up in the soil. And you've got also things like tsunamis and sea regression that are coming in the land and flooding the, the fields as well. Um, so all of that is kind of quite, um, quite important to, um, uh, to, to keep in mind when we're talking about the, the salinity stress and, and also fresh water. Fresh water is a very, very precious resource. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, working in Saudi kind of really made me realize that the petrol there was cheaper than the bottle of water, uh, which is which is kind of crazy. If you wow, think. really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would, it's, it's hard to imagine, but I believe yeah. it. I 100 percent believe it. Yeah. So I think the other thing that when when we're talking about like studying stress, a lot of people are studying stress in terms of survival like whether a plant is going to survive it or not. And they are applying very high level of stress, which, you know, it's, it's one way of approach a question, but survival is very, very complex traits. And it's relying on many different processes that are contributing, whether a plant is surviving or not. And um, so I try to focus on the levels of the stress that are definitely sublethal because those are the levels of distress that plants in the field are more likely to experience, and especially in the fields that are usually farmed. Uh, because so you said you, you look at levels that are sublethal, so yes. not quite lethal, won't kill the plant, but will... They won't kill the plant, but they will definitely make it grow much slower because the plant is having difficulty in getting all of the energy and all of water as well right. um, uh, for, for the growth. Um, but, uh, and, and it's definitely going to affect the yield of the plant mm -hmm. as well. And that's what we humans usually care the most about. If you normally get, I don't know, 100 bushels out of a field and all of a sudden you only get 50, then that's, that's a big problem for, um, for you as a farmer. Right. And so what, um, what species are you looking at? What are some of the, you know, the research findings you found? Yeah, so I started my work in Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a tiny, tiny model plant. And it's it's easy to work with because it's small, so you can grow them on the very small Petri dishes. Um, and um, and the genome is very, very, uh, very small. So we knew we had a lot of resources that are already that were available from that. 
And recently, I kind of diverted my attention to um, go from Arabidopsis to Solanum pimpinelli folium, which maybe some people already heard about it because BTI is um, is uh, is is pretty uh, pretty big in in working with tomatoes and wild tomatoes as well. So. Um, so this tomato is a close, the closest relative to cultivated tomato. And it's also very tolerant to salt, heat, and drought. And that's a nice thing because Arabidopsis itself, it's not super tolerant, but it's a model plant. So we can, it has the mechanisms that to react to salt, but we're not really learning anything from it about the tolerance. Well, so Sorry, just to jump in. So Arabidopsis, is, it's a model plant, so it's really easy to work with. Yes. It's small, it grows quickly, you get seeds, generation are, are very short, yeah. general time. Yeah, so you, yeah, you can get- but The wild tomato, the Pimpinella folium is like, that has the traits that you want to learn about. Yes, exactly. So okay. we're learning about the tolerance from someone that actually, well, or something that actually knows about the tolerance. Um, but it's it's much more challenging to work with because the plant is much bigger. Uh, mm. It takes much longer from, from a seed to seed. So in Arabidopsis, we go in three months maximum, you go from seed to seed. In tomato, that period is a little bit longer. And also the architecture of the tomato is much more complex. So Arabidopsis is usually growing in those rosettes that are flat and they are producing uh, producing the, the leaves on the one, one plane. So you can image them from the top. Tomato, on the other hand, has much more a 3D architecture. So it's growing out, it's branching out, and then and it's, it's much harder to kind of see through and what's happening, right? So that's a challenge that I think we can, we can, we can start uh, exploring. Yeah, so you looked at the different, um, uh, you looked at salt levels in those plants while you were at Kaust? So what I did at Kaust, so when I started, so this is, um, when I started my PhD, I looked at the root system architecture and how mm -hmm. this is changing. So that was back in Amsterdam. And um, in here, you can see that when you grow plants in the increasing concentrations of salt, they're automatically becoming to starting to grow smaller, right? Um, but then my question was, is it only smaller? Is it, is, are they just developing slower or are they, are they developing any differently? So that's when we set up, started to set up very different models for monitoring the main root growth, with what speed is it growing, with what speed are the lateral roots popping out and with what speed are they elongating and studying natural diversity panels. So those are basically Arabidopsis taliana that are growing all over the world. So they were, uh, they were, they are growing in Japan. They are growing in Ireland. And by looking at all of those accessions or ecotypes, some people like to call them, we we discovered that there are the different um, different strategies that that the plants are um, reacting to salt. Um, but then when I when I started working at Kaust and talking to Mark Tester, we realized well, I realized um, that. A root system architecture is a hidden half of the plant, but it's still a half. So I started to focusing on how how changes are how changes are occurring in response to salt on the whole plant level, and that's when I started to focusing on also on the root to shoot ratio because with drought we know that this is a very important parameter. So plant wants to limit the loss of water. So the shoot is, is not growing very fast while the root is proliferating, scavenging for water and nutrients. Uh, but nobody really studied yet uh, how this is changing in response to salt. So we did, again, studied natural diversity panels, did, did something called the genomoid association. And that allowed us to kind of identify which of the genomic component, genetic components are contributing to the changes and the responses and uh, so-called phenotypic plasticity that we're so seeing. You, so you looked at the entire genome of the plants and, and try to tease out which ones might be associated with with the salt response and root yeah so what you what you have how how GWAS is working is you've got uh you've got an entire genome and across the entire genome you've got some things called SNPs so single nucleotide nucleotide polymorphisms mm -hmm. and those are basically variations like we vary as well 
Um, but in the, you've got individual positions in the genome where you've got a reference accession, and that doesn't really matter who you're choosing. And then you, you, you look at individual positions in the genome, whether something is exactly the same as, the, as your reference or, or, or not. And then you group your population into two groups and see whether there is a significant difference in the phenotype that you're looking at. And then you're doing it, it's not for one position, but for all of the positions across the genome. And that kind of allows you to, um, to pinpoint which of the regions might be involved. And then you can, you can look at specific mutants in that specific region to see, haha, are they, are they showing the response that I actually expect? So it's kind of, so you're looking for mutations in different genes, basically, to see if it helps them grow in, in higher saline, higher salt. Var yeah, a variation, because mm -hmm. mutation, it's, it's, you're assuming that the gene is not functional, but sometimes in natural diversity panels, a mutation can cause a gene to be super functional or functioning just a little bit different. So we're looking for like superheroes across, across <laughs> our, uh, our, our different ecotypes. Mm -hmm. Super selenum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and did you, you find some genes? You found yes. some mutations? Yeah, so for the root system architecture, we found a gene. We found quite a lot of genes because we had a lot of uh, different traits. Um, so one of the genes that we found was actually previously associated with selenium tolerance. But uh, they, the, the, the researchers that were doing the research in that was, were saying that overexpression of that specific gene, um, so this is HKT1, um, and it's an ion transporter. And people have found that if you've got high, ex high expression of that specific gene, you've got much better tolerance. But we found that high expression of that gene is also leading to reduced lateral root development which is uh, quite important because depending on when your plant is experiencing stress, is it at the very early seedling stage or at much more mature stage, that gene is going to have a very different effect on your overall performance as a plant. So if you've got that gene higher expressed and you're a very, very tiny seedling, maybe not the best idea. That's interesting. Yeah. And for the, for the root to shoot ratio, the gene that we found is a totally unknown function. So there are a lot of genes that we don't know anything of what exactly are they doing. And we're still figuring out to, in which tissues is it expressed, uh, what are the individual domains doing, where in the cell is it coming, and also when we knock it out or make it a super gene, do we see a super plants? So that's still in progress. Right. Well, that's very cool. Mm. And uh, so you mentioned this, you know, high throughput phenotyping. Yes. Uh, so when I, yeah. So when I started, when I started working at Kaus and and realizing that, oh yeah, a root is only the half of the plant, and the the shoot start to be to become also also much more interesting, and also the appeal of the shoot is that you can do much more high throughput phenotyping and phenotyping uh, of the of the shoot because it's it's especially in Arabidopsis it's easy to visualize that it's easy to quantify that so what high throughput phenotyping is is really when you're um, when you can image any aspect of the plant that is super automatic and in here you've got two different kinds of phenotyping so you either have that plants are moved on the conveyor belts like on the on the on the movie that is here on the left so the plants are growing in the growth chamber and whenever it's time they start to the conveyor belts move them into the into the chambers where we've got very expensive cameras sitting and they can measure uh, the the plant uh, how big it is but also how green how different green hues are distributed over and also we can we can measure the chlorophyll fluorescence which is an indicator of how your photosystem is performing so it's mainly photosystem too doesn't really matter but so this it is basically how if i understand this correctly it's it, it measures how well the plant uses sunlight to make sugars at the end right exactly yes so some will do better than others oh definitely especially during the salt the, the stress 
because okay. the what is the fate of the of individual photons that are hitting the plant the plant photosynthetic apparatus is that not all of the photons are going to get translated into the molecules of of sugars but also they can be lost through reflection or lost through through the heat dissipation because the the the, the whole a photosynthetic mechanism is going to be way too busy with dealing with all of the photons and electrons going in and not all of the photons are going to be caught up and then translated into the sugar. And, and so extra salty soil impacts impacts that part of the process. Oh, definitely. Yes. Oh, and it's, okay. it's usually impacting it at a very short time scale. So we can already start seeing an effect after one hour of stress so but you don't you, you you won't be able to see it with the naked eye because with what you see with the naked eye is chlorophyll content and that's a pigment and pigment is something that is that is reacting to stress or reacting to changes in environment at much slower rate so for example like you're going into a hawaii which we can only dream about that at the moment you're going to hawaii you're having a, a sun bath and you're getting nice tan. When you're coming to Ithaca, you're still having a tanned skin, although you're not really like being exposed to any sun. So the same happens with the chlorophyll content when the stress is actually affecting the photosynthesis and the chlorophyll. It is that the change in the chlorophyll content is going to be taken at much longer time scale than the changes are actually really happening. Sounds so so that, that's quite exciting, but uh, examining the chlorophyll fluorescence also requires dark adaptation. So plants need to be sitting, they're going through conveyor belts and you don't see that because it's kind of hard to film. Um, they are going into a tunnel that is dark and they have to sit in the dark tunnel, tunnel for 15 minutes to kind of adapt to the dark so that there are no photons, no electrons that are busy in, the, in their photosynthetic mechanism. And that kind of allows us that when we're transporting that those plants into our photosynthesis measuring device and all of the flashes that that the plant is going to experience are really measuring the full potential of the plant at that specific point. But you can imagine that if you if you want to measure the photosynthetic capacity of the plant every hour and every hour the plant has to undergo for that 15 minutes of dark adaptation you've got kind of like a Schrodinger effect on your plant. Just because you're measuring it, you might influence how the plant is growing because it doesn't get like full hour of the sunlight. It only gets 45 minutes. So that's, um, that's tricky, but it's still, it's still very interesting. But that's, that's when we're coming to a different setup where you actually don't, you say, okay, I don't want to have all of those expensive par parameters. I want to have like just one simple camera that I put above my plants and like I measure how they are growing every minute. And that's that's when we come in with the with the Raspberry Pi systems. I like so, Raspberry Pi. <laughs> so <laughs> sounds raspberry, yummy. <laughs> that's yeah, I yeah. So Raspberry Pi is nothing. Well, it is sweet, but it's sweet mm -hmm. in a very different sense. So those are just very tiny computers. And this is one of the computers. So, so that's a Raspberry Pi computer. This is a Raspberry Pi computer. And what it has, it, you, can, you can attach the USBs, you can attach Ethernet to it, power and so on. And it's, um, you can also attach cameras to it. It's tiny. So what you, what you have, and the cameras are varying in size. So this is one of the cameras. And actually the camera is only like this tiny button here. <laughs> Um, and you can hang up the cameras above your plants or sideways or however you want to, you want to do that um, and monitor them basically as often as you like. You can monitor the plants every single minute. It's maybe not going to be very exciting uh, because the plants are not growing that fast. But if you're interested in the tiniest changes to growth rate, there you go, you can, you can study those. So we have already set up together with Andrew Nelson. So here's not the, yeah, not the best, it's, the, it's my fault. I, I was making a picture of Andrew uh, with a rig. So you can see that there is, there is basically like a, like a cube that we made out of wood. And you've got on top of this crate, you've got two, um, two pieces that are made of transparent plastics. And that's where our cameras are attached. So the, the computer, 
So the computer is, is sending signals to the camera at the moment every 30 minutes and, and making the picture every 30 minutes so we can study how our plants are growing. And then later on with the, with the plant CV, so that's another software that has been developed by our colleagues in the Danford Center, we can actually isolate which pixels in that image belong to one plant and how they are increasing over time, which, which is very valuable information. So this video that's going on, there's a picture every 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so how, like, is this a couple of days worth this video? Do so you know? this is almost four weeks. Oh, wow, okay. Yes. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're able to study the plants with in quite extended extended period of time. Of course, later on, when you've got plants, leaves that are overlapping other leaves, you're not able to score the growth of those new leaves that are still overlapping because the, the overall like projected plant area is not really changing. But we're still able to catch the plant changes in the plant growth earlier on. And that's, that's the period that, that we're the most interested in. We're interested in in the responses to the to the stress during the early vegetative stress. And so this looks to just to my eye, this looks a lot less expensive than all those conveyor belts and Oh, definitely. So it really depends what computer. So you've got this Raspberry Pi, I think this is four. So this computer is around $50, but we've got also the cheaper ones that are Raspberry Pi zeros. You, do, you have to do a little bit of your own soldering work. So that's, that's, my, that's my piece of work that I did there. Um, but they are around $20. $20. And we've got the cameras. The cameras, I think, are, there's $20 per camera. So you can imagine that we can, at the moment, we've got 12 of those rigs that are operating constantly in the gross chamber at the BTI. Wow. And of course, we can we can change that and adjust it because our, this this setup is perfect for Arabidopsis. But you can imagine that for tomato, you cannot only image it from above. We have to also have some of the cameras that are coming from the from the side. So right now, we're we're trying to set those things up for for bigger plants that are a little bit more complicated than Arabidopsis. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of your uh, Solanum. Pimpinella folium plants, they're pretty tall. They are, they yeah, are. Just like tomatoes, really, yeah. Yes, yeah, but they are much smaller. And if you try to eat their fruits, they are pretty bitter. But yeah. don't, because we're growing them for seeds. <laughs> I did not eat anything. I did okay. not eat any of them. I, I don't dare. <laughs> oh, these are very neat. These yeah. are very neat. And this looks like, um, we did get one question. I'll just um, ask it real quick. How could your work be adapted for middle or high school science labs? And um, that little rig looks like that could maybe be used. Oh, definitely. We can, so right now we've got an experimental program going on for um, with uh, um, Gustavus College in Minnesota. And we have sent them two rigs with the Raspberry Pis and and and, uh, and one of the Raspberry Pis is kind of acting as a as a as an internet collecting all of the data. Um, so this definitely can be adapted that, that we 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 can we can we are planning to publish the design of of those rigs that anyone can build them really. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. And, and then you can, you can make the Raspberry Pis make picture time series of really anything. You, it can be Arab, Arabidopsis growing, but it can also be tobacco growing. It can be like, yes, yeah, sky is your limit. It can anything, be duckweed yeah. that is propagating and really anything. That's, and, that's very neat. And it's, I think it's, it's going to be very valuable and people kind of, you know, um, exploring further on that design because the more people are like building it in their own way and maybe it's not exactly the same but a little bit different that that's how innovation is happening really right. okay i just have one more question for you and then we'll move on to the uh the q a session yeah um so we talked a bit about you know the the high salt in the soils and how that impacts crops how do you see you know this this type of high throughput Phenotyping. How can it help 
farmers as, as the climate change, you know, makes these kinds of, of impacts on the environment? Yeah, so what we're what we're doing right now is we're studying not only so we're studying the interspecific variation in the plants that are actually tolerant and one of them is tomato. And we study we study the phenotypes that are usually not used by the breeders. So either those super highly temporal phenotypes that it's hard to say whether the plant is one plant is growing faster than the other uh, when you're just looking at them at individual time points. So these highly temporal uh, changes are hopefully going to identify some new loci that later on can be included in the breeding program. So we identify the genes and hopefully the variation in that genes or the version of a gene that is going to make a plant super plant. Um, and plant breeders can use that information to improve crops. Basically. Exactly, exactly. So we're doing it at the moment for the um, for the tomato as well, and we also explore the tomato root system architecture. So those are on the on the right side of the of the of the slide. You can see a couple of yeah. the different root architecture ideotypes that we identify just by eye for now, and we're quantifying the growth of those individual roots as well. Um, but we're also collaborating with mathematicians to describe like you see something and you know immediately that this is different. You can see that the Christmas tree is different than the telephone pole, but how do you crunch it in numbers? Because if you if you just compare the total root size, how many white bits we've got, it's very similar. And the overall growth rate of the plant, it's also pretty similar, but how do we different, de determine the differences? So we're working with people that are working on describing the urban networks uh, with, the, with their specific algorithms. And, and we're really seeing the difference. Uh, the problem is that the urban networks are very static systems and we're working with growing things. So that's, again, it's, it's, um, it's quite exciting to work with them. We're also working on other crop uh, that is uh, known to be tolerant, and that's a cowpea. So cowpea is, or also known as the black-eyed bean. Black so eyed just, yeah, black-eyed peas. Sorry. Um, so we just started to to propagate some of the seeds that we got from the collaborators, and we're also planning to look at the architecture, how they are growing, the root system architecture, and and hopefully. The genes that we find is are making so what is making cowpea so drought tolerant so tolerant to heat and, and 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 other stresses hopefully we can we can we can discover which genes these are and then later on transfer it to other legumes that are maybe not as as tolerant to drought or heat yeah and then um another thing that we're we're high through so high throughput phenotyping is basically everything that you cannot see on the individual time point or, or with your naked eye. So we're also planning to include in the, in the facility that we're planning for the Boyce Thompson Institute, we're planning to include multispectral imaging. So that allows you to quantify the content of anthocyanins or chlorophyll without, without going into the plants, taking a leaf, making your own extraction. You can really quantify it just from the image. So that's hopefully is going to, um, further help with identifying the, the, new, the new components of, of tolerance to, albeit um, abiotic stress, but also hopefully we can also help our colleagues that are working on the biotic interactions to identify new mechanisms of pest resistance. Um, yeah. That's very cool. Thank you. So that's lots of things. It's, it's nice to hear how you know how this really cool research is you know can can impact us all you know potentially all over the world yes. Yes. <laughs> Not gonna... uh, okay well thank you so much magda um that was really cool um all right now we're going to go to go to some q a from the uh chat box um first up does excessive road salting in the u.s have an impact on plants uh from from what I've seen around Ithaca, you can still see some of the plants growing. Um, I don't. I, I think it might, uh, especially because salt in the in the soil that is high in organic content, it tends to stick around more. Um, 
we have observed, so we, back in the Netherlands, we did a study on collecting local accessions of Arabidopsis. So we went around the whole country, collected, collected some of the plants and measured actually iron content um, in the leaves of the plants that we collected from different locations. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we were thinking, oh, maybe there is a correlation with the distance to the sea, uh, and the and the and the salt content in the leaves, we didn't see any correlation with the distance to the sea. We did see a high correlation with the distance to the road. Very interesting. Yes, so it definitely does affect how plants are growing. Uh, I don't know exactly what is the salt composition in the salts that are being spread on the U.S. roads, but it I, I wouldn't be surprised if if that's uh, if 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 it does have an effect. Yeah. That's interesting. It's good. It could be kind of a double-edged sword, though. You know, maybe it will it will be bad for some plants, but then there are other ones that will have these mutations that thrive. Those could be those could yeah. be where you where you can collect them. Yeah, the source of the salinity tolerance could be just on the curve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be just down the road. Yeah. And where do you find the wild tomatoes? So I'm guessing that's a Pimpinella folium. And yeah, so wild tomatoes are, so there is a collection um, in the USDA um, California Center for the tomato. And those tomatoes, the Pimpinella folium, its natural uh, distribution is the west coast of South America. So it's Peru, Ecuador. There are some of them that are found on Galapagos Islands. Um, back in Saudi, we were also studying um, to tomatoes that were predominantly from the Galapagos Islands. So those are Solanum um, Chismani and um, some of them were also Chilense. Um, because those tomatoes were having legendary um, uh, tolerance to salt stress, at least that's where the stories were coming from, that you've got, you know, on the island of Galapagos, you've got the plant that is growing in the sea breeze, but it still keeps on growing. But accidentally, so that's how we started to work on, on Pimpinelli folium, because among those seeds that we got, it was a mistake, and they also sent us accidentally a Pimpinelli folium rather than Chilense. Um, and um, sorry, cheese money. Um, and that accession was the most salt tolerant of all of the other accessions that we found. So then we we're like, oh, maybe we should study more Pimpinelli folium because they are much closer related to the cultivated tomato. Um, so, yes, so they are, we've got their Peru, Ecuador, and I think there are a couple of like just a few accessions from the. Um, from the Galapagos Islands. Galapagos. Yeah. And uh, what equipment do you need to measure fluorescence? Is it a special camera, I would guess? Yes, yes. So chlorophyll fluorescence is actually kind of difficult to measure because you need a camera that can measure outside of the visual spectrum. So you cannot mm -hmm. measure it just with, just with Raspberry Pi. Mm -mm. And it's also very important because you need to know like so the, the plant when you when you're flashing it with light it is going to fluoresce right but then you need to kind of coordinate when is your flash going to be delivered at the plant and when is the flash being caught by the camera so this timing is is being extremely extremely important mm -hmm. and then we also have um chlorophyll fluorescence that you can actually adjust at the individual light intensities later on and then that's how you also can measure quenching or quenching parameters. So that's how efficient the plant is and how much of the energy is going into, into the light reactions or, um, or he, being lost in heat or, or, or um, reflection. reflection. Yeah. So those cameras are pretty, pretty tricky. There are other devices and I've got one here that are, that people can buy and it's called Photosync. So it's just, it's a little little thing and it's measuring in here it has a light sensor so you can clip it on your leaf and it's um, automatically running a protocol for a basic fluorescence but the thing is this is only measuring the fluorescence of the area that you actually have clipped in when you have visual imaging it measures the chlorophyll fluorescence across the whole plant 
And you have to also keep in mind, so usually students or people that use this thing, they are not very happy because the fluorescence is going to be very, very different depending on which leaf you're going to measure and how that leaf is going to be positioned. And um, when you're measuring it using the image-based chlorophyll fluorescence, you can, you can later on in your image software um, determine like, oh, I only want to measure the leaves that are fully developed or only the leaves that are just, just, just developing because those are the most important ones because they are contributing the most. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it allows for a certain flexibility, but you can measure chlorophyll fluorescence in, in many, many different ways. So the, so the big ones you're talking about, like, are they too big for the rigs you were building or they, they just generate too much data for the Raspberry Pi to handle or? The cameras? Yeah. Yeah, so the cameras, they are, they are way too expensive. <laughs> um, and it requires very, very tight control of the light conditions. Mm -hmm. So I know that at Michigan State University, they do develop those cameras to be kind of built into the growth chamber and as far as that, and, and those are exactly the same people that develop this. So they are having an extremely tight control of the, of the, of the light conditions. And then they measure, they don't do dark adaptation. They just let the plants go throughout the day and they measure the chlorophyll fluorescence that is dark adapted during the night hours. So then you've got basically continuous chlorophyll fluorescence throughout the day, but it's it's definitely not ready yet, uh, at least for the for the for the for the easy accessible solution as as is with the RGB phenotyping. So RGB is just color images. Green blue. Yeah. Uh, next question is tomato root architecture species specific. So I guess that's. The droopy telephone pole. And ah, yes, no. So this is this is actually pretty exciting. So after studying root system architecture in Arabidopsis, um, I started working with Pimpinelli folium, and the diversity within the Pimpinelli folium was through the roof. I have never seen that much of the diversity within single species. So no, the diversity is within um, within one species. We are studying some of the some of the root system architecture in cultivated tomato as well, just to kind of have a comparison. Um, but no, it is it is definitely only within one species, and we're still um, trying to. So we know that there are some of the subpopulations. So you've got kind of like Pimpinelli folios that are more related to each other, like more cousins. And we're still figuring out if those different root system architecture are more specific to like lowland pimpinelli folium or pimpinelli folium that are only growing at a certain latitude. Uh, but we, we haven't seen any connections yet, which is, which is quite interesting. It is interesting. Uh, if you're breeding towards a salt tolerant genotype, what do you consider an ideal root centric idea type for tomato or any species for that sake? I mean, is there, is there an answer for that at this point? So I like, think it's the best root architecture. Yeah, so salt is a little bit trickier than, well, and, and drought is also trickier because, so I don't, it's going to be depending on the situation really. And, and depending on the scenario, whether you've got um, salt that is accumulating in the top layer, like in the Nile Delta or the Nile, yeah, the, the, the river Nile where you've got like slowly uh, lowering levels of salt, then you would probably want to have plants that are having more roots in the deeper soil layers. Mm -hmm. uh, but plants, we know that plants can sense where the salt is in the soil and they can grow away from that. So you definitely want that mechanisms to be working. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in general, we would like to have a plant that just keeps on growing because that's the best strategy for, for dealing with salt. So if you, if you stop growing and your salt keeps on accumulating through evapotranspiration, so transpiration of the water from the soil and evaporation through the plant, the, the, the concentrations are not going to get any sm smaller. It's only going to get worse. So if you've got a plant that just, can just kind of musters through and keeps on growing, it will still accumulate some of the salt and some of it is going to accumulate in the older leaves that then fall off, but they are not, the salt is then out of the soil. So the plant can still keep on, keep on growing and, and make their life later on much, much more bearable and much more bearable for the next generation. 
So I would say the ideotype for the salt is is uh, is a growing plant. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> if, if it's growing, it's good. Uh, what is the approximate minimum and maximum focal distance of the Raspberry Pi camera? So um, depends on the camera as well, because this is this is a very simple camera. I think with this one, we managed to image plants that are on this distance, but then your the region that you can actually image is, is very small. There are also other cameras that are a little bit more high tech, like this one. Okay. That looks high tech. And this one, of course, is more is more expensive than twenty dollars, uh, but we can we can image the plants at the much much smaller thing, and then from the um, larger distance. So at the moment we're imaging the the rigs from forty centimeters, thirty centimeters, I don't, like a little bit more than a foot, and um larger than that it's probably possible but you're losing on the on the precision of your measurements and again we've got different setups if we're imaging arabidopsis rosettes and we also are working on the setup where we're imaging continuously imaging the roots of the plant because that we want to really do it on on per 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 five minutes base but then the changes that you that you're seeing in the plant growth are much much smaller so you want to be much closer to your plant to detect all of those changes as 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 precisely as possible. So I think it ranges between 10 centimeters to oh definitely like a meter or two meters. So you can it's 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 the camera is fixed, but we figured out that if you there's a seal that you it's glued, you have to break the glue and you can actually adjust the focus of it. And obviously those cameras you don't need to break anything to adjust the focus because it just does it like with turning and what in your opinion is the best live root phenotyping technology available for studying root development in action mm. mm -hmm -hmm. <laughs> what is the best like <laughs> Is it the, the, the most cost efficient? We're still using scanners. We're just scanning the roots. <laughs> and that's that's definitely the most um, available for, for most of the people. So oh, those are the, th the, like the plates, the things are growing in plates? Yes, yeah. Right. Um, there are people that are growing them on the rhizotrons. So those are the, um, you basically have a, a plexiglass or, or a plastic, transparent plastic. And you've got soil and then you've got another plate of, of transparent plastic and then people are growing them in the soil and can image the roots uh, but for that it's heavy it's very big so you need a space and very often uh, extraction of the of the of the roots from that image it's quite labor intensive so i haven't there are some softwares that that claim to be very automatic but usually what they give you is just total root size. They don't give you like, oh, when is the root branching? Things like that. So those usually, and the root people know it, you really need to love what you're doing because it is going to take quite a lot of time to, um, to get all of the data because it's still half, half automatic, which means half manual. And that means that you have to still do quite a lot of work yourself, unfortunately, but Hopefully with, with machine learning, it's coming up right now and people are trying to extract traits in a more automatic way from the pictures. And we do, as a community, we do have quite a lot of ground truth data, which means you've got the picture and then you've got all of the data. How long is your route? Where are individual lateral routes? So hopefully that will help develop those machine learning models in the future. Mm -hmm. So that reminds me of a, of a little project I saw, um, you know, somebody was talking about middle and high school students before, and um, they were doing something similar, but instead of getting big things of plexiglass, they were just using old CD cases, like compact mm -hmm. cases, you know, you pull the, you know, the, oh, that's the, fantastic. the CD fits on, you pull that part out, and then you close it up, and you put some soil in there, and you put, you yeah. see, and it grows right in your little CD case, and then you can you can see, you know, because it's like, yeah, and then and you could see the roots growing, and yeah. I what what I think you could grow just about any plant in there, right? I forget. Yeah, I think 
so those those setups are very good for the plants that have relatively thick roots. So Arabidopsis wouldn't fare very well because the roots are so, so fine and tiny. So the diameter of the roots is very small. But things like beans or tomato are, or, or tobacco even, that, that, that should fare fairly well um, in, in those setups, yeah. Yeah, that's neat. I, I, I forgot about that. I'm glad that- should... Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, just simple CD. Who, who owns CDs now though? Yeah. We still have some. Just okay. like taking around. They're they're pretty. They're getting more and more rare, though. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question: Have you done any genomics or transcriptomic studies with your phenotyping with these tiny cameras? Not yet, but that's that's exactly what we're planning to do with Andrew. So with Andrew, we're like cluster lab. So we're we're working very tightly together. And so forward genetic forward genomics is, is pretty, pretty, pretty good in identifying the genes, but you still don't really know, like you've got a bag of genes still, and then where do we go from there? So what we're planning to do with Andrew is to do, to do exactly what, 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 what the person was asking is to do transcriptomics in those across different time points in the plants that are tolerant or susceptible to stress, and then compare compare make this make the transcriptional networks and compare those transcriptional networks which components are specific to plants that are tolerant and which components are specific to plants that are susceptible and kind of find not one gene but find a combination of the genes because i think at this point time and point in science we should move beyond thinking about individual gene we should look at genes networks or combinations of genes that are making the plant much more tolerant and that tolerance much more diverse for different scenarios so the plant is equipped to to with with all of the mechanisms that might happen and that makes our research hopefully uh, more broadly applicable um this looks like a follow-up to a previous question would a batch of tomato seeds have different root architectures um it might there are some of the there is yes basically there is some plasticity in how they are responding especially depending on how you grow them so if you grow your plants in a less watered conditions or in well watered conditions the architecture is definitely going to change just because it's going to respond to all of the local cues now, if we're growing them on the plates, agar plates, which are fairly homogeneous in the in the conditions that that the, the soil the soil conditions, the grow conditions, so they they have equal number of nutrients, equal number of um, moisture, and things like that, they are fairly consistent. Not exactly the same, but they are going to be the so the trait that we're looking at is heritability. So that means like, okay, so how heritable is the growth rate after salt stress application, let's say. So when we're looking at those traits, they are showing a fairly high heritability. There is still some, to some degree, it's caused by, by random effects that we cannot control. But most of the time we have, um, we have a fair, fair reproducibility in the, in the architecture of the plant. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're getting close to one o'clock. I'll just do two more quick questions. Okay. Um, are the images captured with Raspberry Pi good for 3D reconstruction? Mm. Uh, yeah, you probably could do that, but you would have to have some kind of markers. I've got one of my friends, she's an engineer and she is using those, I forgot what they're called, but they're like basically cubes that have the patterns on them and then you're rotating that with so you could you could rotate your plants with that cube also being in the picture and then that cube will help you from the probably 3d reconstruction mm -hmm. um so you would need to so it's all about camera calibration for the 3d reconstruction right and and you would need to include things in the image to to allow you the 3d reconstruction because the cameras themselves they, they probably can be calibrated, but I don't, I don't have enough technical know-how how to do that. And maybe would you need three cameras, like one X, Y, and Z 
you would probably need much more than three cameras. So what we're doing right now for the for the for the tomatoes and for the beans is we are setting up um, a rotating platform. So the plant is growing; it it is positioned on the rotating platform, and the Raspberry Pi is also controlling the uh, the current that is going into the into the rotating platform. So the plant, whenever the current is on, the the plant just keeps on turning. And then whenever there is a time to make a picture, which is let's say five minutes, then the rotation stops, plan mm -hmm. stops, and then we, we make pictures from the side and from the top. And then it goes again, so it turns only a little bit. And then because we keeping, keep, keep on doing it throughout the plant growth, right, growth period, you are going to see basically a combination of the 3D and the plant growing. Okay, last question, then we'll wrap up. Uh, capturing a picture every 30 minutes for four weeks will develop a lot of data. How do you select data for your analysis? So, yeah, that's true. So it is, we are at the moment struggling with kind of making a database for all of the images and, um, and keeping track of what is what. So that's definitely a very viable challenge. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to get the period that is as complete as possible. So um, we're getting uh, from the, we're, we're starting to measure the plant growth from the moment that we can recognize individual plants from the soil, um, which is approximately uh, a little bit more than a week after germination, which is fairly early. Mm -hmm. And then we keep on, keep on the imaging and analyzing the data all the way until the plants start overlapping because at this point we cannot tell which plant is what, and uh, and that would require a manual separation. So we're 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 looking at the images at the time points. Okay, this is the time point that they are starting to overlap. Like let's just not like ignore those those part of part of pictures, and then choose the last picture to analyze when it's just the moment before before they start overlapping their leaves. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Magda for taking the time to chat with us today. And thank you everyone out there for joining us today and asking such amazing questions. There was, there's a ton more that we didn't get to. Um, there's really, really great engagement, lots of good questions. Um, I'm going to put some um, links in the chat for everyone to see. Um, and if you could please uh, join us for our next Breaking Ground discussion series, it will feature an interactive chat with BTI Susie Strickler. That's on Thursday, March 28th, and we'll be talking about the ways that she's using genomics to explore the diversity of life. And that's going to be a really good one. So please don't miss that. Go to btiscience.org to register. And uh, you can also read more about our current research and many other needs. BTI Science in our 2019 annual report, which you can find online at the next link there, btiscience.org slash annual report. And we're currently working on 2020s, so we'll get even uh, more neat stories than that. And uh, just want to, again, thank everybody out there for supporting BTI and being part of our community. We really appreciate it. We are a nonprofit research institute, and we operate in part thanks to the generosity of community members like you. And if you would like to make a gift to support BTI, you can donate online at btiscience.org slash give, or you can email our development team at development at btiscience.org. And all those links are down in the chat. And thank you again, everyone, for interest and your support of BTI. And thank you again, Magda, for doing this with us today. Thank and you. I hope you all have a wonderful day and be well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.